couple quick things first. Um, so that nobody can say that we never mentioned this in class, even though it is on the syllabus, uh, because I did get a question about this earlier. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that the final exam is on the 27th from 10.30 to 12.30 in this room, right? You will come here. And our paper is not due that day. Our paper your, paper is due is, May 1st. your paper is due May 1st. That's correct. What are grades due for seniors, though? Like, do we need to get it ahead of time for some of the stuff? Um, that, should be, um, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. I think grades are due for seniors on, like, May 5th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we graduate on the 4th. Yeah. Well, at any rate, it's not going to be a problem. Okay. It's 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 yeah. It's it's not it's not going to be an issue. Um, so the format is going to be the same as the midterm exam. It's just going to be a little longer. It's going to be two essay questions and ten IDs. And I will give you sample questions to help you study uh, sometime next week, so that you're prepared for it. Does anybody have any questions about the exam? So two essay questions in the question. There will be two essay questions and 10 IDs. And they will be very similar to the ones that were on the midterm exam. And I do want to remind everybody as well that the exam is going to be cumulative, right? It is going to cover both halves of the semester. So you will have to go back and look over things that we did in the early part of the term as well. Okay, any questions? All of that stuff that would like be covered in the study guide, the things that you need to keep in on, right? Everything will be in your notes. Um, there will be nothing on the exam that we didn't specifically talk about in class. Right, any terms in the IDs will all be things that were introduced in class discussion. All the questions will focus on things that we actually talked about in class. Any other questions? Can you type out the essays ahead of time to save our hands? That's a nice idea, but no. It was worth a shot. Yeah. You, you never know unless you ask, right? Well, and remember, too, the, the sample questions you get are not going to be identical to the questions that will be on the exam. They'll be very similar, but they'll be a lot more broad. The questions on the exam will be much more specific and focused. Anything else? Yeah, Jody. What can I make on work? Okay, um, I will give everybody an opportunity to make up one missed in class writing. And by missed, I mean um, you were actually not in class that day, right? If you were here and didn't do it, well, that's that's on you. Um, <clears throat> but I will send you an email sometime over the course of the coming week, um, letting you know which ones you missed. For most of you, I mean, most of you are here all the time anyway, so this is only an issue for a few people. Um, but yeah, you'll have the chance to make up one. You'll just do it at home and bring it with you on the exam day. Yes? I had one other question. Uh-huh. It was about like the makeup for, well, not makeup, but like the rewrite for the midterm paper. Mm-hmm. Um, will that just like show up on Georgia View? Yeah, the grade will just change on Georgia View when I get that done. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm just, you know, this is... I was just worried, like, I got no credits. I was like... No, no, it, it, it's, yeah. I, I, I will let you know when I've done it. Okay. It's just be, because everyone already has a grade, it's right. been less of a priority for me than, than other things that were a little more pressing. But, yeah, it, it'll... No rush. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 will, that will get done. Um, and, yeah, you'll, you'll just see, yeah, you'll see the grade change in Georgia View. And if there is no change, I'll still tell you. Anything else? Yeah, Kayla. That student teachers come in next class, right? Yes, that is another thing that I just want to remind you of. But right, Dr. Nyawalo is coming next time, right, to talk about to talk with you about the first half of the Epic of Sanjata. Um, so please, please, please be nice to him. We want him to think this is a nice place to work, right? Mm -hmm. We want him to like you. I I like you, <laughs> and I want him to like you as well. And that reminds me as well, right? This is the last class period for which we'll be using volume B, right? 
So remember that from now on, the readings are going to be in volume C. That's the green one with the guy in the furry, ornate Renaissance robes on the cover. This one. That one, yep. OK, any other questions? OK, great. Then, to connect my abiding interest in the history of popular music with the course material, does anybody know what a bodhisattva is? Yeah, Zach, what's a bodhisattva? It was <clears throat> so a religious figure from Buddhism. It's essentially like a priest, isn't it? Not quite. Yeah, Kayla. Isn't it someone who like helps guide someone else to like enlightenment? Yeah. So we are talking about it's a Buddhist concept. And yeah, a bodhisattva is someone who has attained enlightenment, but rather than going on and becoming a Buddha, becoming a perfect spiritual being, him or herself, they stay behind in the mortal world to help guide other people. But they don't have like an organized structure for Buddhism, do they? Not, or like, no, not really. I should say within most of them because mm -hmm. they have weird Buddhist there, there, there are schools of Buddhism. Um, in Japan, for, there are a number of different Buddhist sects, one of which is going to be pretty important for our purposes today. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but yeah, a bodhisattva sacrifices their own chance at, enlightenment, at total enlightenment to help other people get there, to, get, to make it along the way. Now, what this particular song is about um, it was written when the members of the band moved to Los Angeles and they saw all of these rich record executives um, getting interested in Eastern philosophy and particularly in Buddhism, right? These kind of anti-materialist philosophical and religious schools, um, which they seemed to have no trouble um, reconciling with their own accumulation of wealth. And that's one thing that we have to remember about Buddhism as a school of thought, right? Of the three major religions in East Asia, well, four, four major religions in East Asia, it is the most aggressively anti-materialist. Right, to a Buddhist, The visible mortal world is a place of suffering. And what you need to do is cut all of your ties to it in order to move on into a better world. To escape the cycle of rebirth by being reborn into a place from which you can actually achieve enlightenment. So in like Buddhism, it would be better to be born poor? Not necessarily. Um, I guess if, you, if you're not used to having material possessions, it's probably easier to give them up. Um, but the same, in most, most schools of Buddhism, the same paths to salvation are open to everyone. The school of Buddhism with which we're most concerned today is called Pure Land Buddhism. It is today the second largest Buddhist school in Japan, the largest being Zen. But it was really in vogue in sort of like the 12th through 14th centuries. So it has a really big impact on the way this particular text uh, is shaped and what, what, its, what its concerns are, the way it treats its characters. So, Pure land Buddhists call on Amida, the Buddha of compassion, who is associated with the West, 
So you, each cardinal direction has its own Buddha in most Buddha schools of thought. Amida is the Buddha of the West. And he's the ruler of a plane of existence called, oh, how the hell do you spell that? Sukhavati. And Sukhavati is a Sanskrit word that translates to pure land. So, <clears throat> what a pure land Buddhist wants, what their goal is, is when they die to be reborn into Amida's pure land from which they can then receive instruction from him and from his attendant bodhisattvas in order to become Buddhas or bodhisattvas themselves. And you get to the Pure Land by following the Ten Noble Precepts that are common to all Buddhists. You don't have to worry too much about this. It's just pretty basically don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, um, things of that nature. You're, yeah, you're, 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 you're sort of, yeah, you're sort of standard issue um, morals, yeah. Right? We find overall that moral standards tend to be more similar across cultures than they are different, right? There are certain things that no cultures condone, cold-blooded killing, taking things that aren't yours, things of that nature. It's functional. Basically, yeah. The big thing that you need to do to get into the pure land, though, is repeat the name of Amida at least 10 times over the course of your lifetime before you die, right? So that, in particular, is not that hard. And supposedly, if you call on Amida as you are dying, he will, you know, he'll appear to you. This is what the Pure Land belief system is based on. So most people will just call on Amida those ten times when they know they're dying to try to be reborn into his Pure Land. It doesn't always work, or it's not... It, it's, it's not believed that this always works, right? If you have lived a really shitty life, if you have ignored the Ten Noble Precepts all your life, then you will not be accepted into Sukhavati. And you can, supposedly you can tell by looking at the corpse once, you know, once life has left it. If it looks peaceful and calm, smiling, then yes, the person has been accepted into Sukhavati. If it looks twisted up, angry, like it's suffering, then it's probably down in one of the hells. So, that's the belief system that informs much of what goes on in this text, right? What did you, what'd you think of this? What did you guys think of this? Not of Pure Land Buddhism, right? That's, you know, my, my goal is not to, you know, sell any particular school of thought to you, but just of the text itself. What, what, what did you think? How'd this go for you? I think it was a lot easier to notice the religious undertones than some okay. of the other texts. Okay, it's, so, so you, didn't, you didn't find it the, the working in of the Buddhism very subtle? No. Okay, can you give me an example? Um, like on 496 when it says, but they say that even those who lodge for one night beneath the same tree are bound by karma. Uh -huh. in former existence and those that drip water from the same stream do so because of deep ties from other lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So like it's in that one sentence it's talking about karma, past lives, and yep. um, crap. Oh, I guess it was just this. <laughs> but still, like, uh -huh. there's two things that are blatantly written and that was at the fairly beginning of the story. Right, right. Although remember too, the beginning of the story that we get is actually about halfway in, yeah. right? Most of what we get here is from book six onward. 
But I mean, that is kind of different than like even like the Thousand One Nights, where like mm -hmm. you just kind of have to assume a lot of it. Like this is. Yeah, if we look at the uh, the way religion is used in the Thousand One Nights, it's a lot more subtle, right? Um, if you're familiar with certain Islamic beliefs and practices, you see it. But the narrator rarely comes out and says, hey, this is what's going on, right? This is what's happening. But yeah, this particular narrator is constantly making reference to Buddhist concepts. Can we see other examples here of the way um, Buddhism is worked directly into this text? When uh, the grandmother's killing the grandson, the gem to the water. OK, yeah. Yeah, can you take us there? Gazing at his innocent face and struggling to hold back her tears, the nun replied, Don't you understand? In your previous life, you were careful to observe the ten good rules of conduct, and for that reason you were born in this life as the ruler of ten thousand chariots. But now evil entanglements have you in their power, and your days of good fortune have come to an end. First, she told him tearfully, You must face east and bid farewell to the goddess of the shrine, grand shrine of Ise. Then you must turn west and trust in Amida Buddha to come with his hosts to greet you and lead you to his pure land. Come now, turn your face to the west, and recite the invocation of the Buddha's name. This far-off land of ours is no bigger than a millet seed, a realm of sorrow and adversity. Let us leave it now and go together to a place of rejoicing, the paradise of the pure land. So here, yeah, we have one character enjoining another to face west, the direction of the Amida Buddha, and to pray to invoke his name so that they go to the pure land when they jump off the boat. Now... Does there, does there seem to be any note of the kind of condemnation of suicide here that we often find in Western cultures? Yeah, I mean, what's going to happen to these two if the enemy forces catch them anyway? Yeah, it doesn't matter that the emperor is only eight. It doesn't matter that the nun of the second rank is an old woman. Conflicts of this sort, conflicts between samurai clans observed uh, what we would call the rule of vendetta. When you were at war with another clan, you eliminated the whole clan. That was what was expected of you. You could not achieve victory, you could not rest secure in your power until every member of the other clan was dead or in exile too far away to hurt you. Now, they leave most of this stuff out, but there are scenes in the Tales of the Haike in which the victorious Minamoto warriors kill women and children so that they can't grow up to threaten them. So what the nun of the second rank and her grandson, the emperor, are doing here is essentially taking what seems the only, the only road to controlling their own destinies. Right. They can decide to die here and now rather than falling into the hands of the Minamoto. So... As far as the historical context for this is, con is concerned, we're dealing with two periods of Japanese history bleeding into each other that have very different social and cultural values. The introduction in the textbook keeps talking about medieval Japan but I think we've established how I feel about using the term medieval to describe non-European cultures, right? It doesn't really apply. We're not talking about the same thing here. Any similarities between 12th century Japan and medieval Europe are largely superficial. So every, all the action here takes place 
at the end of a period called the Hayan. And this lasts from about 794 to 1185, basically to the day that the Emperor Antoku and his grandmother jump off of that boat. That's the end of the Heian period. Now the Heian period was a time of heavy Chinese influence on Japanese culture. The Japanese government was modeled on that Chinese civil service system where um, you know, applicants were supposed to, for government positions were supposed to study the Confucian classics and take that series of exams to get a post. So you still had people studying the Confucian classics. Um, you still had people <coughs> participating in a kind of court culture, but it was much more sort of rife with nepotism than its Chinese equivalent was. You didn't necessarily get posts based on how well you did on, you know, on an exam. You got posts based largely on who you were related to. So they didn't actually take the imperial tests? No, they, they didn't, no, they didn't take an exam. They did study the Confucian classics, and they followed a more or less Chinese way of life. In fact, Chinese was the language of the court during the Heian period. Japanese was a peasant language. <clears throat> Sophisticated people did not speak Japanese. So <clears throat> you had a strongly centralized government with the imperial court at the middle. And these officials who were trained in the Chinese classics and Chinese philosophy, in poetry and arts, um, were called Kizoku, which is a Japanese word that loosely translates to a courtier or aristocrat. And families gained influence primarily by getting their daughters married to the emperor. So if you could get a daughter of your family either married to the emperor or an official concubine of the emperor, that increased your influence. Even as an official concubine? Yeah. No different than being an official mistress in France or England. Sure. It meant that your family then had the emperor's ear. Now, the most powerful family during this period were the Fujiwara. The Fujiwara were powerful enough that it was decreed that only a Fujiwara mother could bear an imperial heir. So the Fujiwara always got their daughters married to the emperor. And only their daughters were, like, only the, only the, the sons of their daughters were allowed to become emperor. Up to the period that the tale of the Heike describes. Now, as far as the artistic values of this period are concerned, the primary tone that we get in Haiyan era literature is called mono no aware. Three words, 
Mono no aware. What is that again? <clears throat> Mono no aware. No, I know what that is. Oh, okay, it's, I'm about to explain what it is. Okay. So it translates more or less literally to sensitivity to things. But the specific concept it denotes is a kind of um, melancholy delight in the passing, you know, in observing and lamenting the passing of natural beauty and the beauties of human life. So it's a tone very similar to a lot of what we get in like the, the poems of Lebo except without that desire for immortality or permanence or transcendence that we get in Libo. The mono no aware sensibility accepts the ephemeral nature of things, that all things must pass, and tries to squeeze that last little bit of beauty out of them. So the probably the most typical example of high-end era literature is a work that's known as The Tale of Genji. Have any of you ever heard of The Tale of Genji? Okay, Zach, you know The Tale of Genji. Okay, what do you know about it? I don't actually remember anything about it. I just remember it was, it was in one of my classes that I read. Okay. The Tale of Genji is concerned primarily with the romantic adventures of one of these Kizoku, a courtier who is a sort of slightly less than legitimate son of the emperor. And Genji is extremely sensitive to both the beauty of women and the beauty of his natural surroundings. Yes? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of hung up on that. Like, if they're only allowed to marry from one family... Oh, no, they're allowed to marry from lots of families. But like if the emperors are all from the same family and then they marry daughters from that family, wouldn't that lead to like incestual relations? Because you would then be the only see, emperor see here, be the son of... Historically, it's actually really fairly only recently that that's a thing that we've become uh, aware of or hung up on. Remember that there are some ancient cultures that actually married brother to sister in order to keep the bloodline pure. The ancient Egyptians, for example, um, frequently, um, that's why some of the, late, the latter pharaohs, uh, if you look at the uh, monumental architecture, they're a little bit funny looking. That's why people in Europe started getting tails. Yeah, well, yeah, but you know, like, people didn't understand genetics, right? They had no real concept. They didn't realize, for example, the danger of passing on genetic diseases, by marrying um, you know, people that were too closely related to each other. Um, their primary interest was in keeping the bloodline pure, and this family's interest would have been in maintaining their own power, maintaining their influence over the emperor. That, frankly, would have been more important than if a couple of kids were born with tails or extra fingers. Yeah, what's an extra finger here and there? You can still be emperor, right? So, by the end of this period, there's a shift in values, right? So, the high on court is very, very centralized um, in the capital, which is mostly in Kyoto during this period. Now, the rest of the country is ruled by provincial governors and magistrates most of whom come not from this courtier class, but from a warrior class called the Bushi. And the Bushi were not expected to be refined and sophisticated. They were not expected to compose poetry. They were not expected um, to be expert landscape painters. Um, they weren't expected to do things like powder their face or blacken their teeth or do ceremonial dances 
or things of that nature. So they were rulers without the court rules? Essentially, yeah. They were a much, yeah, much more sort of practically oriented. Practically, like, they were keeping order in their districts. And many of these clans become very powerful and very influential. Well, that was like a, like a period of time where there was a lot of conflict, though, wouldn't it? Then when they raised warrior classes up. That's probably. Um, I was thinking it was towards the end mm -hmm. of the period that they were starting to get conflict. Well, the conflict at the end of this period occurs between two of the most powerful Bushi families. The Tyra, also known as the Haike, and the Minamoto, also known as the Genji. Right, so when you see Taira and Haike in this text, they were talking about the same family. When you see Minamoto and Genji in this text, they're talking about the same family. They had been allies in getting a particular imperial candidate onto the throne, and then they fell out with each other. And the leader of the Taira, Taira no Kiyomori, did not perfectly observe the rules of vendetta when the Minamoto were defeated the first time. Right, so they, the Tyra drive the Minamoto out, but he leaves the two Tyra heir, the two Minamoto heirs, Yoritomo and his brother Yoshitsune, alive. And so by about 1180, when the events in this text are taking place, Yoritomi and Yoritomo, sorry, and Yoshitsune have come back with an army. They've gathered a lot of these other Bushi families together to try to take control of the capital themselves. So it would be interesting, I think, if we look at the way some of the Tyra characters are described in this text. There is a definite pattern here. If we look on page 1289, we get our first description of Kiyomori. Right. Kiyomori was the oldest son and heir of Taira no Tadamori, the minister of punishments, and the grandson of Masamori, the governor of Sanuki. Masamori was a ninth generation descendant of Prince Kazurahara, a first rank prince and the minister of ceremonies, the fifth son of Emperor Kanmu. So he's the son and heir of a courtier, the minister of punishments, and he's also the grandson of a provincial governor. So what does this indicate about his class status? So that would, that would mean he's not part of the, the other thing, not the Bushi, right? Well, he's kind of both. He's from a Bushi family that has worked its way up into Kizoku. So they, they can actually be a part of two? I just figured well, it would just be like, what, if you move up, like mm -hmm. I just figured you move up, you move up. Well, that's the thing is that, you, know, you, you can't really, right? And Kiyomori is, throughout the text, portrayed as a rule breaker. He's the grandson of Ibushi, bless you, who has had the gall to make himself into a courtier and essentially to take charge of most imperial affairs. So he's an educated warrior? Yeah. I mean, I guess. Or, or, or at least a refined and sophisticated warrior. I mean, if you have like strict, um, what, do you, what do you call it? Social cleavages, though. Mm -hmm. That's like not exactly what. 
Paleo. Yeah, well, essentially, this is a guy who's elbowed his way into high society. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> it does, right? But when you've got the army. I'm following anyone who has an army against me. I'm be like, no, you got it. Yeah, and you whatever you want. the emperor at the time is reliant on his support. Right, so where Kiyomori goes, the throne goes. Now, the other rule that Kiyomori has managed to break, he's got one of his daughters married to the emperor. Who's, yeah, who's not a food, yeah, and that's fine, right? The emperor can marry whoever the hell he wants. But only those are recognized as the... But only the Fujiwara daughters, uh, the, only the Fujiwari grandsons are recognized as imperial heirs. However, this young emperor Antoku, the eight-year-old emperor, is the son of a Taira woman. So, Kiyomori's family has overstepped this social rule as well. Kiyomori has also taken Buddhist vows, which require him to shave his head give up his title, his lands, and his property. But we see throughout this that he's not done so, right? He still goes on living as before. So it's Kiyomori's arrogance and Kiyomori's defiance of social rules that end up bringing bad karma to his entire family And, well, really, the, the whole thing ends with their complete elimination, right? At the end of this, there are no more Tyra. They're all dead. Bless you. And Kiyomori's the one who gets the ball rolling. And if they would have followed the law of Vendetta, it would be the opposite, right? If he would have followed the rules of Vendetta in the beginning, yes, then he wouldn't have had to worry about the Minamoto. But, because all things pass away anyway, eventually the rule of the tyra would have come to an end and Kiyomori speeds it along by not following the rules by accumulating all kinds of bad karma right so <clears throat> let's turn actually briefly to Kiyomori's death What's unusual about the way he dies? Yeah, he is burning from the inside, right? And nothing they can do will cure it. Nothing will even ease his suffering, right? They go and they get this water from a holy well to try to cool him. It does nothing. The efforts of doctors do nothing. There is nothing at all that they can do to comfort him, right? On page 1291, from the first day that Kiyomori took sick, he was unable to swallow anything, not even water. His body was as hot as though there were fi a fire burning inside it. Those who attended him could scarcely come within 25 or 30 feet of him, so great was the heat. All he could do was cry out, I'm burning, I'm burning. His affliction seemed quite unlike any ordinary illness. Water from the well of Thousand Armed Kanon on Mount Hiei was brought to the capital and poured into a stone bathtub, and Kiyomori's body was lowered into it in the hopes of cooling him. But the water began to bubble and boil furiously, and in a moment had all gone up in steam. In another attempt to bring him some relief, wooden pipes were rigged in order to pour streams of water down on his body, but the water sizzled and sputtered as though it were landing on fiery rocks or metal, and virtually none of it reached his body. The little that did so burst into flames and burned, filling the room with black smoke and sending flames whirling upward. Now, <clears throat> if we skip ahead a little bit to 1292, in earlier days, 
The prime minister had always been brusque and forceful in manner, but now, tormented by pain, he had barely breath enough to utter these words. Ever since the Hogan and Haiji uprisings, I have on numerous occasions put down those who showed themselves enemies of the throne, and I have received rewards and acclaim far surpassing what I deserve. I have had the honor to become the grandfather of a reigning emperor and to hold the office of prime minister, and the bounty showered on me extend to my sons and grandsons. There is nothing more whatsoever that I could wish for in this life. Only one regret remains to me, that I have yet to behold the severed head of that exile to the province of Izu, Minamoto no Yoritomo. When I have ceased to be, erect no temples or pagodas in my honor, conduct no memorial rites for me. But dispatch forces at once to strike at Yoritomo, cut off his head, and hang it before my grave. That is all the ceremony that I ask. Such were the deeply sinful words that he spoke. Now, for a Pure Land Buddhist, what should you be focusing on in your final moments? Yeah, releasing yourself from this world, right? Releasing yourself from material ties. All he can think about are material ties, earthly regrets, and earthly relationships, right? He doesn't even want temples and pagodas erected in his honor where his soul will be prayed for. Yeah all, he, yeah, all he wants is the head of his worldly enemy placed upon his grave. He has no thought whatsoever for the next world. On the fourth day of the same month, the illness continuing to torment him, Kiyomori's attendants thought to provide some slight relief by pouring water over a board and laying him on it, but this appeared to do no good whatsoever. Moaning in desperation, he fell to the floor and there suffered his final agonies. The sound of horses and carriages rushing about seemed to echo to the heavens and to make the very earth tremble. Even if the sovereign of the realm himself, the lord of 10,000 chariots, had passed away, there could not have been a greater commotion. Now, if you have managed to pass into the pure land, right, then your death is peaceful. Your expression is peaceful. His death is accompanied by noisy commotion and by these horses that um, seem to reflect back on the dream that his wife had, right, about this chariot that's come to take him off to the, uh, which hell is it? Right, the hell of never ceasing torment, right? The worst place you can go in Buddhist cosmology because there's no rebirth out of that. The hell of never ceasing torment is where the completely irredeemable go. Those who will never reach enlightenment. And that is what's in store for Kiyomori. But are all of Kiyomori's relatives quite so bad? Yeah, the tone of the work changes quite a lot after Kiyomori's death. Right. Under Kiyomori, the Taira are clearly villains. But once their leader is dead, the text treats them much more sympathetically. Right, we have this, you know, the poet, Taira no Tadanori, who begs his old poetry teacher to include some of his work in an upcoming imperial anthology, and then leaves. Whoever's phone that is, if you could please silence it. And then when he dies, if we look on page 1300, Taira no Tadanori, the governor of Satsuma, served as, a com as commanding general of the western flank at the Battle of Ichinotani. Dressed in a battle robe of dark blue brocade and armor laced with black silk, he rode a sturdy black horse fitted with a lacquer saddle flecked with gold. Surrounded by some hundred horsemen under his command, he was retiring from the engagement in a calm and unhurried manner, halting his horse now and then to parry with one of the enemy. Now, the reason I bother to quote this is because this is actually a very common narrative device 
in these um, <clears throat> com these shogunate era Japanese warrior tales. It's called Dressing the Hero. You can usually tell which figures in the narrative are supposed to be important because the narrative voice will settle on them for a minute and tell you all about their weapons, their armor, their clothing, their horse. Okabe no Rokuyada, a member of the Inamata group of Genji warriors, spotted Tadanori and galloped after him in pursuit, urging his horse forward with spurs and a whip and shouting, who goes there, declare your name. I'm a friend, replied Tadanori, but as he turned to speak, he revealed enough of his face to make it apparent that his teeth were blackened. Ha, thought Rokuyada, no one on our side looks like that. This must be one of the Tyra lords. So the powdered face and blackened teeth What does that represent? What, is, what does this tell us about Tadanori? He's still following the thing of the Kazoku. Yeah, he looks like a Kazoku. He looks like a courtier. Then he should be looking like a... If he was a friend of the Minamoto, as he says, yeah, he wouldn't be done up like this. Um, teeth in their natural state were considered ugly, and so Japanese courtiers actually blacked them out so that you couldn't see them. Because that looked better? <laughs> they thought so. Hey, you look, you know, people in all eras, in all places, do very strange things in order to be beautiful, right? And you gotta remember, they didn't have uh, modern dentistry back then. The natural state of their teeth. Yeah. Probably was Yeah. Most. Rotting most out teeth. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you, you never, I mean, you know, it's not that long ago that people often just had their natural teeth pulled and put in false teeth even when they were in their 20s, right? Because your teeth would rot and get ugly. But yeah, um, what these are courtiers' practices. The poem that is attached to his quiver. This is also evidence that he's a courtier and not just a warrior. The parallel episode immediately afterwards with Tyra no Atsumori this was made into a very famous uh, Japanese play later on. But right, Atsumori also has the powdered face and blackened teeth and is carrying a small flute when he's killed. The flute was, well, the flute was actually considered, um, like in, Euro look, in most European cultures, the flute is a peasant instrument, right? It's something that we associate with shepherds. Um, but in Japan, the flute was actually considered a courtier's instrument. In fact, it was considered the instrument most appropriate to a courtier. I mean, like a bushi wouldn't have any instruments, would they? No, a bushi probably wouldn't. But a courtier certainly would. A courtier would probably know how to play something. But how do these bushi respond after they've killed these guys and they discover the poem and the flute? How do they feel about this? Yeah, it makes them weep that they had to do this, right? It makes them cry that they have had to kill people who are so refined and sophisticated that they've had to kill artists. So <clears throat> while we are seeing a transition from a courtier culture to a warrior culture, there's also a lament here for the courtier culture that has passed away. The values of these Tyra warriors are not the values 
of the Minamoto who destroy them and will succeed them. But even these Minamoto warriors appreciate what it is that they're killing, what it is they're destroying. That they are removing beauty from the world in some sense. So according to most, um, most Japanese readings of this text, the dominant tone or tones really are first uh, what's called mujokan. The Mujokan translates loosely to sense of impermanence. Right, that nothing can last. No thing of beauty can last. No earthly power can last forever. Secondly, an idea that's associated particularly with Pure Land Buddhism called Mapo, M-A-P-P-O. And Mapo means decline and disorder. So the state of the world as described in the Tales of the Heike, is one of Mapo. Now, it's the Tyra who allowed things to get to this state, and the Minamoto who are supposed to be putting things back together. But it's still clear that even these unrefined warriors maintain some sense of this old mono no aware, this sensitivity to beauty. Now the era that comes after, the era in which this chronicle is actually composed is called the Kamakura period. Kamakura lasts, what are the dates? 1185 to roughly 1333. And the Kamakura period is the first of a number of what are called shogunates that will then last into the mid-19th century when the imperial lines are stored. Does anybody know what, what, a show, what a shogun was? What shogunate means? Uh, the shogun was the uh, overall military leader. Mm -hmm. like but they weren't actually... The shogun was the head of all the clans, but the clans individually governed their lands, so it was... Right. It's kind of similar to the way the feudal system worked in, mm -hmm. in Europe, but not exactly. And yeah, and different shoguns had varying levels of control over the whole country. So there was still an imperial line that was maintained for largely sort of spiritual purposes, right? Because the emperor was regarded as the descendant of the sun goddess, and so he still remained a kind of spiritual center for the nation. But in actual practice, the nation was ruled by, yeah, military generals. Shogun translates to general or commander. Wasn't this the same period of time where, like, they started really getting strict with all the rules? Like, even people who were not warrior classes still kind of had weird military rules. Like, if one general or whatever went to war, he would take, like, mm -hmm. his people with him, even if they're not a part of the warrior class, he'd just take them. Well, that's how armies functioned back then. Is, yeah, is I mean, most event. most European armies were largely made up of peasants with pointy sticks as well. When the noble decided I just feel like I remember this is the period of time where they, they gave me that sickening description of the uh, disembowelment that they would do. 
Oh, uh, seppuku is I think what you're thinking of. Yeah, uh, that was the yeah, seppuku is the ritualized suicide. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. Um, this is a side note. Yeah, but the way seppuku works is uh, um, if you have been shamed or disgraced, the honorable thing to do in samurai culture was to was to kill yourself. And the way you were supposed to do it, you're supposed to kneel, and you have your wakazashi, which is your sword sword, your katana is your long sword. Yep, and you disembowel yourself. And you are not supposed to scream. Yeah. And if you make a full circle, then you've done your job. Yeah, well, yeah. well the, the way it was to prevent you from screaming and further shaming yourself, your friend is standing behind you with your katana to cut your head off if it looks like you're about to scream. So would the bushi not be samurai? The too, like, yeah, the, right the bushi class evolves into the samurai class. Okay. The samurai are really more of a shogunate era thing. Okay. Um, and the bushi is the high end period. Like, yeah, the bushi would be yeah, these provincial governors and magistrates, um, these sort of military officials during the high end period. And yeah, I mean the word bushi actually still applies afterwards, but yeah, there. There isn't really a samurai class to speak of until the Kamakura period. This is, you know, when these bushi kind of ennoble themselves. Well, it is interesting. Um, under the Code of the, mm -hmm. which is what samurai operated on, yeah. they took on the stuff in the Kizaku, the love of the art. Sure. Which, yeah. And you know, and we see that, again that the appreciation of these unrefined Minamoto warriors for the refinement of the people they're killing. But one more thing I want to say about the Kamakura period. Now, all of the characters in the Tale of the Haike are represented as Pure Land Buddhists, right? This is actually kind of historical back formation. Pure Land Buddhism wasn't introduced into Japan until eh, roughly just after this war had taken place, right? It doesn't take, it's introduced around 1180, so around the beginning of this war, but doesn't really become popular until a few decades later. So we have another one of these invented histories, right? Where the values of a later period are read onto an earlier one, right? Much as Dante connected himself to the Trojans through the Romans, right? We've seen this sort of thing before. And this is something I actually want you thinking about when you start reading Sunjata, right? This idea of invented tradition and of reading contemporary religion, contemporary philosophy, contemporary politics back onto events that happened a long time ago. Um, Sunjata is actually a living oral tradition. So I have a couple of guide questions for you. Remember again that Sunjata is in the green book, it's in volume C, it's not in volume B. And I just have something to give back to you. I have your writing on Lebo to give back to you. So just sit tight for a minute. <laughs> 